It's a pleasure to be with you today to talk about HIV prevention, treatment, PrEP, and microbicides. My name is Sharon Hillier. I'm a professor at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine in the Department of OBGYN, Microbiology, and Molecular Genetics in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Today I'm going to move through um, an overview of biomedical HIV prevention opportunities, a little review on condoms and male circumcision, I'll spend a fair bit of time on treatment as prevention, focusing predominantly on the HPTN 052 study. And from there, we'll move to oral prevention uh, using ART as well as topical microbicides and end with a few thoughts on the need for combination strategies for prevention of HIV. As shown in this slide, there's really a spectrum of prevention opportunities, starting with behavioral and structural issues such as circumcision and condoms, and I'd like to spend a few moments just uh, thinking again about what we can do using these kinds of old-fashioned uh, technologies to prevent HIV. It's good to remember that condoms are the single most efficient available technology to reduce the sexual transmission of HIV and other sexually transmitted infections. And for those of you who provide care for HIV-infected people, it's important to remember that condom counseling and provision is really an important part of a combination prevention strategy. Although it's clear that many, many people will never use condoms effectively, there are a substantial minority of people who can use condoms efficiently. 14 studies looking at 13 cohorts of people who said they always use condoms showed an HIV incidence of 1.14 per 100 person years, whereas 10 cohorts of people who reported they were never users had an HIV incidence of 5.75 per 100. What that means in simple terms is that consistent use of condoms yields an 80% reduction in HIV. These kinds of data have been uh, both um, praised because they provide good evidence that HIV can be reduced with condom use, but they've also been criticized because they report on, uh, rely on self-report of condom use and are somewhat older literature. However, a new study was recently published just this year in the Journal of Infectious Disease by Jim Hughes and his colleagues at the University of Washington. They followed 3,297 HIV serodiscordant couples from seven African countries for up to two years. And they looked at the new infections that happened in those serodiscordant couples. And importantly, they were able to link the infection from the primary partner to the person who acquired HIV using viral envelope and gag sequencing. What they reported in this study was that those who said they consistently used condoms had an 80% reduction. So I think this is contemporary important data that suggests that the protective benefit of condoms is still 80%. And all of us who um, talk about HIV prevention need to remember to discuss the importance of condoms as part of a prevention package. I'd next like to touch on circumcision. And as all of you know, circumcision has been around for a long time, practiced for over 2,000 years, and it really is a strategy that essentially reduces the number of targets for HIV in men. There were three randomized trials of male circumcision to reduce HIV infection conducted in the Rakai district of Uganda, in Kisumu, Kenya, and in the Orange Farm area outside of uh, Johannesburg in South Africa. And each of these studies was amazingly consistent in demonstrating a 50 to 60% reduction in HIV among men who were circumcised. Importantly, follow-up data um, reported last year and the year before have now provided years of follow-up on these men who were offered circumcision and have demonstrated that there's a long-standing protective benefit. That is to say, the reduction in HIV was not related to participation in the study, other protective um, counseling and uh, condom provision and other kinds of things that happen in clinical trials, but rather 
it was actually due to the circumcision because years later we're still seeing a 50% reduction in HIV in men who were given circumcision. Although it is considered in many uh, quarters now and in, in, interestingly enough has um, been flagged as a, a male mutilation issue uh, by some in the West, I think we still need to consider that male circumcision continues to be a really important strategy. Now, moving from condoms and male circumcision, I'd like to spend a few minutes on the other end of the spectrum, treatment of HIV and how that re relates to reduced infectivity. We had a, n a number of studies um, that showed that um, when people were evaluated in couples and the uh, HIV positive couple, um, part of the couple, was given highly effective antiretroviral uh, that, in fact, there was reduced transmission. One of the best of these studies was one by Deborah D Donnell, published in Lancet in 2010. And in this study, what they found was that among 4,558 person years of um, in heterosexual discordant couples, that there were 102 infections for an incidence rate of 2.2. When then the HIV-infected person started effective antiretroviral therapy, there was only one infection in 273 person years, or an incidence rate of 0 0.37. What that meant was that there was a 92% reduction in HIV transmission from an HIV-infected person to their HIV-negative partner once they were on effective antiretroviral therapy. Now this study, although it was quite good, was criticized because it was not a randomized trial. It was just an observational study. The breakthrough that happened the next year was a study by Mike Cohen and his colleagues from the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And this study was called the HPTN 052 study it was published in 2011 in New England Journal, and if any of you have not read the study yet, I would urge you to do so. The study was designed as a randomized controlled trial of stable, healthy, serodiscordant couples who were sexually active and who had CD4 counts between 350 to 550 cells per um, cubic millimeter. And what the primary study design was to randomize people to immediate antiretroviral therapy, even though their CD4 counts were at a level at which treatment was not recommended in their, in their respective countries, compared to delayed ART when CD4 counts went to two, less than or equal to 250. The primary transmission endpoint was whether or not these serodiscordant couples transmitted virus to their uninfected partner. But a number of other primary clinical endpoints were evaluated, including stage four clinical events, pulmonary tuberculosis, bacterial infections, and death. Now, as you can imagine, um, this uh, when the study was designed, which was um, almost a decade ago, the idea that doing immediate therapy was um, was actually quite controversial because the notion was that there may in fact be no benefit to the person getting immediate therapy. And at the same time, observational data like the Donnell study that I just showed you actually suggested that there was a benefit. So there were a lot of ethical discussions relating to this study. As shown in the next slide, I just wanted to spend a moment or two reviewing who went on this study. So there were 10,838 individuals who were screened, and the main reason uh, that people were excluded were that they were HIV positive, but their CD4 counts were out of range, or that their partner was ineligible because they were already HIV infected. There were 1,763 couples and 3,526 individuals who were then randomized to immediate therapy versus delayed. ART. These couples came from the Americas, 278 from the United States, uh, some from Brazil, Botswana, South Africa, Malawi, Zimbabwe, Kenya, India, and Thailand. So it really was a global distribution of participation. 
As summarized in the next slide, there were a total of 39 HIV transmissions in these couples, and they were sorted by linked or unlinked. Unlinked meant that essentially when they looked at the virus from the HIV positive person and compared it to the um, virus that was in the um, H a person who was originally HIV negative, they found that the viruses were different, which meant that, that the infection happened outside of the relationship. Those 11 transmissions shown in blue on the right-hand side were excluded then from the analysis. There were then 28 linked transmissions where they knew that the virus from the infected person did, uh, was transmitted to the uninfected partner. And as summarized there, they showed that in the delayed arm, there were 27 transmissions, and in the immediate arm, only one. And that was quite remarkable. 64% um, of transmissions from infected participants with higher CD4 counts um, and viral loads at 50,000 copies occurred. And as shown as well, most of the transmissions occurred in Sub-Saharan Africa, and about two-thirds of the transmissions happened from a HIV-infected female part of the partner to the male partner. However, overwhelmingly, and uh, quite clearly, there was an enormous 97% decrease in transmission with effective antiretroviral therapy that controlled viral load. So on the next slide, what you see is the proportion of participants with a viral load of less than 400 at each visit. And what's remarkable is that in the HPTN 052 study, the antiretroviral therapy was clearly taken and quite effective. And shown there in the blue bars in the immediate treatment arm that people overwhelmingly had good control of their HIV infection. In the delayed arm, not on ART, you can see the level of viral control was quite low and stayed low until as they became eligible for antiretroviral therapy, shown in the uh, red um, striped bars, that eventually uh, as people began to enter uh, treatment, they ended up having a higher proportion with controlled viral load. So if we think about this, um, what happened next after the announcement was the study was stopped and the DSMB recommended that all infected people be offered ART, immediate treatment. And so they then have continued follow-up in HBTN 052, which is still ongoing today, with 96% of those who are, were originally the index cases still retained and overall 85% uh, retention of the serodiscordant couples. And importantly now, 1,561 of the total number of 1,682 HIV-infected persons called index cases are now on antiretroviral therapy. So why is this study ongoing with everyone on antiretroviral therapy? It's just essentially to ask a couple of questions. Is there durability of prevention? And when we think about delayed uh, antiretroviral therapy, do they have different clinical outcomes than people who were offered earlier treatment? And these are critically important questions as we understand the benefits to people to getting early antiretroviral therapy. So with this study, it's been quite clear that treatment can have broad benefits to society. And data from the PEPFAR program and the CDC shown in the next slide have summarized that for every 1,000 people who are on HIV treatment for a year, it's estimated 228 deaths are prevented, 450 children are not orphaned, that we have done a great job in preventing 61 sexual transmissions of HIV, preventing 26 vertical transmissions of HIV, and prevented nine tuberculosis cases and gained 2,200 life years. So every 1,000 patient years of patient treatment prevents or saves 2,200 life years. I think this is a remarkable success, and the success of treatment as 
both preventing death but also preventing infection, was then recognized, as shown in the next slide, as the science breakthrough of the year in 2011 and uh, caused the economists to actually devote a cover story to this study about how HIV treatment can maybe be an important tool in the end of AIDS and how many million lives have been saved as a way of defeating the AIDS epidemic through treatment. So with all of that enthusiasm, I'd like to spend a moment or two on the next slide, which is a cartoon showing the HIV prevention cascade, where unfortunately our aspirations for treatment as prevention meets reality. In the United States, uh, it's estimated that of 1.2 million uh, infected individuals, that essentially only 80% are diagnosed, then only a proportion of those, 77%, are linked to care, and only a proportion of those are retained in care. What that means in real terms is that essentially in the United States of America, it's estimated currently that only 28% of Americans having HIV are in therapy and, on, and suppressed with viral loads of less than 200. So although we understand today that treatment is an incredibly important tool for prevention, that in our own country with so many resources, only one in four Americans living with HIV is actually achieving the benefits they should. So I think it is a wake-up call for all of us to think about how we can do much better in linking uh, people, uh, identifying all of those people who have HIV, linking those HIV inf infected people to good care, ensuring that ART is provided or offered to everyone who would benefit, which arguably is everyone, and maintaining people a care so that they can have suppressed viral load. This recognition that treatment of HIV is an effective strategy to prevent transmission has really energized the HIV prevention community because targeting HIV-infected people and suppressing infection to prevent secondary transmission I think provides a great opportunity to put those kinds of strategies together with the next thing I'll talk about, which is antiretrovirals used as pre-exposure prophylaxis and microbicides. In the interest of time today, I'm not going to have an opportunity to talk about vaccines. I think most everyone knows that vaccines against HIV have been in development for over 30 years, and there have been at least uh, one study, one study that has shown a modest protective benefit of about 30% in prevention of HIV. That is a really important um, prevention modality with lots of research ongoing, but in the interest of time, I will not talk more about it today, except in the end to note that we really believe that all of these strategies are going to be need to, needed together in order to defeat the HIV epidemic. So I'd like to spend a few minutes now talking about the very uh, interesting data that have emerged on the use of pre-exposure prophylaxis for prevention of HIV. So I'd like to start with the first study that was published um, done by Bob Grant and his colleagues in Men Who Have Sex With Men in Brazil, Ecuador, Peru, South Africa, Thailand, and the United States. This study called IPREX was performed in 2,500 men who have sex with men, and they were considered really quite high-risk men in that they were reporting multiple new partners and acts of unprotected anal intercourse. As is shown in this slide, the number of HIV infections in those um, taking uh, imtricitabine and tenofovir was 36 compared to the oral placebo. Men in the study were given condoms. They were given uh, safe sex counseling. All of their sexually transmitted infections were treated, and they were followed over time. 
nonetheless, um, what it was demonstrated very uh, effectively was that in these men who have sex with men, there was a 44% reduction in HIV. And these data were recognized as one of the Time Magazine top 10 medical breakthroughs of the year in 2010. Other studies uh, that have demonstrated PrEP F efficacy are then include the Partners PrEP study. This study was completed in 2011, and it involved heterosexual couples that were serodiscordant. There were 4,758 couples enrolled from Kenya and Uganda, and again, two kinds of oral t um, PrEP regimens were used daily tenofovir, or TDF, or the combination of emtricitabine and tenofovir. As shown in this slide, in the um, overall, and there was a, a single placebo group for um, both of those arms. And as you can see, there were 17 HIV infections in the oral tenofovir arm, 13 in the emtricitabine tenofovir arm, and 52 in the placebo arm. This study was stopped early by the Data Safety Monitoring Board, and when it was re, uh, the results were announced in 2011, there was a 67% PrEP, PrEP efficacy for oral tenofovir and 75% for imtricitabine tenofovir. These data were just published in the New England Journal of Medicine this year, and I think uh, gave uh, a lot of enthusiasm for the notion that oral PrEP could be quite effective in heterosexual couples in addition to men having sex with men. The final study, which is included in the next slide, is one that came out of a smaller study that came out of Botswana and was funded through the Centers for Disease Control. It really was a safety study of oral daily imtricitabine tenofovir, and as shown in the slide, there were 10 infections in the oral PrEP group, 26 in the placebo group, showing an overall effectiveness of 62%. And this was published in the same issue as the Partners PrEP trial. Now, this data was very, very exciting and, again, gave a lot of enthusiasm for the notion that oral uh, treatment regimens like emtricitabine, tenofovir, could be used to very effectively prevent HIV infections. What was learned from these studies that I think uh, had been suspected but was really proven by these important trials, summarized in the next um, slide, is that tenofovir was detected in only a minority of those who acquired HIV, but in those who remained uninfected during the study, most had or many had detectable drug, suggesting that adherence, not surprisingly, is the key to efficacy. So as summarized there, um, tenofovir in plasma was detected in nine, only 9% 9 of seroconverters and in 50% of uninfected. So what does that mean? I think that tells you right away that in IPREX, only about half of the participants were routinely taking their imtricitabine uh, tenofovir. In the Partners PrEP study in the tenofovir-only arm, about 35% of seroconverters had um, detectable tenofovir compared to 83% of uninfected. And in the same study, Partners PrEP, in the imtricitabine tenofovir arm, it was 25% of seroconverters versus 81% of the uninfected. Now, it's clear from this data that um, not everyone who was taking their drug was protected. And it's also clear that even in the uninfected, not everyone was taking their drug. Nonetheless, these were the first data to show that strong relationship between adherence and PrEP efficacy. However, the news wasn't all good. Uh, when we began to think about how much drug was there um, and how effective um, it was, we found overall, although it was very effective in IPREX and Partners PrEP and uh, in terms of protective benefit in the presence of tenofovir, Another study that was published in that same issue of the New England Journal of Medicine by Lutt Van Dam and her colleagues suggested that PrEP effectiveness was not so high in high-risk women. 
there was a lot of discussion at the time the studies were designed about why so many different studies were being done using exactly the same agent, that is to say, imtricitabine tenofovir. And that, of course, we shouldn't use exactly the same agent in many studies. And I think the, the results that we see is that different studies of different populations do teach us very different things. While there was not tremendous adherence seen in the MSM study, there was still a 42% level of effectiveness. In the FEMPREP study, which enrolled uh, high-risk women, that is women living in high-risk areas, who um, had did some sex work as well as worked in bars and other social venues in Kenya, South Africa, and Tanzania, and who reported always using their drugs. 95% of study participants reported that they usually or always had taken their study drug at the time of study discontinuation. And interestingly, pill counts, when the uh, women brought their pill counts back every month, they found that the, the right number of pills were gone, that 88% of the time pill counts were consistent with good drug use. However, when a tenofovir sample, when the plasma samples were evaluated for the presence of tenofovir, they showed that only 35 to 37% of women who did not become infected had tenofovir and overall suggesting that there was probably relatively low adherence to the PrEP regimen. This study, which has been, I think, somewhat overlooked in all of the good news about PrEP, suggests that not only did people not take their pills, but they knew they weren't taking their pills. That is, the pill counts were adjusted to make sense with what they were saying. So were they giving their pills to other people? Were they throwing the tablets away? At any rate, what was shown was that there was only a 6% protective benefit, which obviously did not reach statistical significance. So when you put it all together, as is shown in the next slide, with the proportion of blood samples with the tenofovir detected and the level of HIV uh, efficacy in the randomized comparison, what you can see is that there is a clear dose response between evidence of PrEP use and effectiveness. But in some cases, for example, in IPREX, with only 50% uh, adherence uh, to, drug, um, to drug use, it appears that there's a higher level of effectiveness uh, relative to um, the 26% or so in the seroconverters who had evidence of tenofovir detected with only a 6% randomized comparison effectiveness. Now, why could that be? Why is um, it so much less effective? There's a lot of really interesting work ongoing showing that tenofovir and tricitabine levels in the gut are about 10 times higher than they are in the female genital tract. So a lower level of adherence may still be effective in, um, in men who are having receptive anal intercourse compared to high-risk women. These data are still a rich source of a secondary analyses, but the main message is that PrEP only works if you use it, and PrEP might not work as well in the anal rectum of men or women, but that um, essentially more data is needed, and it's actually quite a good thing that the broad range of studies was performed in various populations. Based on the three, day, three studies showing a benefit in men who have sex with men, as well as the partner's PrEP study showing the protective benefit in serodiscordant couples, the Food and Drug Administration in July of this year approved for the first time a drug to reduce HIV risk. Imtricitabine tenofovir was approved and I'd like to quote Deborah Bernkrant, director of the Division of Antiviral Products at the Food and Drug Administration, when she said, it's still better to prevent HIV than to treat a lifelong infection of HIV. You can imagine these were somewhat controversial discussions because people were worried. How about, um, would it be possible that people might use these drugs as a date drug um, with um, so what's been called disco dosing? 
um, someone might um, perceive that they would take a, a dose of medication prior to having a sexual uh, exposure, and it may, in fact, not be as effective. There is also concerns about resistance. Now, I should note there that uh, all of, in all of these studies, the people who did seroconvert were, have been evaluated for antiretroviral resistance. And in fact, it was shown that there really has been very, very limited resistance detected in the seroconverters, I think, because most of the seroconverters were not really taking drug at the time of seroconversion, but that clearly bears watching. But these studies have told us that oral and topical tenofovir can work for preventing HIV infection, that adherence to PrEP is key, but it's really not for everybody. Not everyone was happy to take an oral uh, dose of an HIV treatment drug every day. There are lots and lots of questions. Uh, who should get PrEP? How should we deliver it? Should it be in sexually transmitted disease clinics? Should it be in HIV clinics? Who is most likely to benefit from PrEP? Who takes it and who doesn't take it? And do they take it often enough? And how does it relate to behavior? Do people, will people take PrEP before they perceive they're going to have a sexual um, exposure? Or would they really want to take it every day? And what is the real um, population impact on HIV incidence? How will it affect anti uh, retroviral resistant? And what will the cost really be? So there are lots of demonstration projects being planned or uh, initiated currently in order to address those issues. I'm going to spend my last few minutes today to talk about uh, antiretroviral-based microbicides, or sometimes we call it topical PrEP. There are a couple of different agents that have uh, or are in broad-scale uh, studies. The first is 1% tenofovir gel, and the second is TMC20 or the dipivirine in an intravaginal ring, which is used for sustained delivery. Because we've spent a lot of time today already talking about tenofovir-based PrEP, I'll just continue with that and then end today on the dipivirine ring program. The first study uh, that was released about the same time as the IPREX trial of oral emtricitabine tenofovir was the Caprisa 004 study of 1% tenofovir gel. This was a proof-of-concept study. It was a, a phase 2B trial in 889 women, 18 years of age and older, in Durban, South Africa. The women were all required to use contraception. And unlike the daily PrEP studies, in this study, women were asked to use the gel within 12 hours before the time they had sex and 12 hours after sex, with a maximum of two applications in 24 hours. So this was called the BAT regimen, before and after sex. These women were very young, with a mean age of 23, mostly unmarried, and mostly from rural areas. And the study was completed in January 2010 and had 98 HIV infection endpoints and was published in Science in 2010. As shown in the next slide, there was um, a 39% protective benefit of tenofovir gel used before and after sex in prevention of HIV. It appeared to be uh, slightly more effective at 12 months. That is to say, at, at the 12-month time point, the effectiveness shown in the bottom line of that slide was about 50%. But over time, um, there was only a 39% differential between the two arms, although this was the first proof of concept that a topically applied antiretroviral could reduce HIV infection in women. The question on everyone's mind was how well did adherence to the study product relate to effectiveness, and in fact, it did. They measured um, high adherence, which they judged to be greater than 80% adherence to gel product, intermediate as 50 to 80%, and low adherence as less than 50% adherence to gel product. And as shown in this slide, about uh, half of the women, or about 40% um, of the women, actually adhered well to gel. And in those women, the gel was 54% effective. 
among those who used it 50 to 80 percent of the time, it was 38 percent effective, which was no longer statistically significant. And in those who were poorly adherent to gel product, it was only 28 percent effective, obviously not statistically significant. So again, we have the message that tenofovir-based regimens really are quite um, they really absolutely rely on adherence to product use, whether applied topically or orally. One surprise that came out of the Caprisa 04 study was that um, herpes was reduced by 50% uh, in those who were on the tenofovir gel. They had about, as I mentioned, 890 women in the study, and they evaluated all those women to assess who was already infected with herpes simplex virus 2 at baseline. And of those who were susceptible to new HSV2 infection, they then looked again at the end of the study to assess who had acquired HSV2. And as shown in these slides, there were 29 incident HSV2 infections in the tenofovir gel group compared to 58 in the placebo gel group, which gave an overall 50% uh, benefit in prevention of HSV2. This was really exciting news because I think, as most of all of you know, herpes is an important uh, cofactor for HIV transmission. And so there uh, was a lot of energy around the notion of topically applied agents actually having multipurpose, that is to say, prevention of both an STI, like herpes simplex virus 2, and HIV. That um, energy then was translated to evaluation of the daily use of tenofovir gel. The notion was if um, even with high adherence of tenofovir gel use, there was only 50% effectiveness, maybe in fact it could be improved with daily use of tenofovir gel. Tenofovir, as you know, has to be taken up by target cells and converted or diphosphorylated in order to be active against HIV. And the thinking was that the active form of the drug has a long half-life, but new cells are moving into the vaginal environment, into the epithelium, and those wouldn't be protected. So the idea was um, if you used it on a daily basis, would you have a better reservoir of drug and that it could potentially be more forgiving of a missed dose. The MTN, the Microbicide Trials Network, conducted a study called the VOICE trial, which stands for Vaginal and Oral Interventions for Control of the Epidemic. This was a large study that included over 5,000 women, and they were randomized to tablet. Uh, this was a study that looked at oral tenofovir, oral imtricitabine tenofovir, placebo, or tenofovir gel. The study um, surprised everyone about a year ago uh, in 2011 in, because the tenofovir uh, oral arm was stopped, as was the vaginal gel arm, for futility because in the interim analysis, there was no difference in the r rate of HIV infection in the oral tenofovir or the tenofovir gel arms. It's important to note that the tenofovir emtricitabine arm is still ongoing, and um, the analysis will be available later. However, it did show that tenofovir gel used daily was certainly no more effective than coital use of tenofovir for women. There is another study called the FACTS-001 study, which is designed as a confirmatory study of Caprisa 04 to evaluate whether this before and after sex dosing is effective for prevention of HIV in women. There are going to be about 2,600 women enrolling at nine sites in South Africa. The results are expected in 2005, and the notion is, is that this would support licensure of the coital use of tenofovir for prevention of HIV in women. So as of today, in 2012, there are still four studies that we're waiting for to um, assess the effects of tenofovir-based regimen on prevention. As I mentioned, the Partners PrEP study is continuing in Kenya and Uganda in heterosexual studies, but everyone is on active drug, either oral tenofovir or oral emtricitabine tenofovir. The VOICE trial 
uh, of oral imtricitabine tenofovir versus placebo has now concluded, and the results will be announced in 2013. The Bangkok tenofovir study of HIV prevention in intravenous drug users is in analysis, and we have not heard yet when those results will be in an announced. And as I just mentioned, the FACTS-001 study of 1% tenofovir is ongoing in high-risk women currently in South Africa. I'd like to spend my last moment or two just talking about next steps in uh, topical administration of antiretrovirals for HIV prevention. The pivirine is a non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor that's been formulated into a flexible silicone ring by the International Partnership for Microbicide. And the idea behind this is that um, a sustained delivery of uh, the pivirine could essentially take away a lot of the problems we've seen with adherence in both the oral and topical PrEP studies. There are two ongoing studies, the IPM-027 study, which is also called the RING study, which is a double-blind randomized study of 1,650 women in South Africa, Rwanda, Malawi, and Kenya. The rings are inserted every four weeks, and the women will be followed for two years. The enrollment was initiated in 2012, and I think the study is expected to conclude in around 2015. It's, uh, as I mentioned, being done in a range of sites in sub-Saharan Africa, including Rwanda, Kenya, Malawi, and South Africa. The sister study is the ASPIRE uh, clinical trial. This is being conducted by the Microbicide Trials Network and includes 3,476 women who are being randomized one-to-one -to, -one to a placebo ring or a depivirine containing ring, and the sites uh, are also predominantly in sub-Saharan Africa, including Malawi, South Africa, Uganda, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. This study has initiated um, and has enrolled uh, in excess of 300 women to date, and the results are expected in late 2014 or early 2015. So I'd like to end today with the idea um, that there's increasing recognition that no single prevention modality will likely be enough to stop the HIV epidemic. But despite that, we're all feeling quite optimistic about the prevention tools we have. Circumcision and male condoms are very effective for prevention of HIV and should be included in any comprehensive HIV prevention package. Increased HIV testing is critical to identify people who don't know they're infected, but it's also critical that those who are identified as living with HIV have to be linked to care in order to realize the potential benef prevention benefits of antiretroviral therapy. And again, to remind everyone, three out of four people living in the United States are not virally, with HIV, are not virally suppressed at this time. Oral PrEP has been approved now in the United States by the Food and Drug Administration for prevention of sexual transmission of HIV, but there are many questions about how PrEP should be implemented and who should get it. It's clear that adherence is the key to success. We need to understand more about who wants it and who will stick with it and who can use it effectively. Topically applied antiretrovirals have been developed as microbicides, both as gels and sustained delivery rings, and there's been some success with coitally dependent tenofovir gel, and the depivirine is the first NNRTI to move forward and is in phase three trials. And finally, we recognize vaccine is going to be an important part of the prevention package, but even those who are working hard on vaccine development recognize that vaccines, when they're uh, when become available, are unlikely to be 100% protective and that these will be implemented with the other prevention modalities. So I want to leave you with the thought, there is no magic bullet for HIV prevention. Prevention of HIV is going to really take a concerted effort using condoms, identification of effective treatment for positives, pre-exposure prophylaxis with oral and topical ARVs. It's not going to be risk-free or easy or inexpensive, and we recognize adherence will be a challenge. But I argue it will work and that we have in our hands the tools to turn the tide of this epidemic. 
and to actually eradicate HIV in our lifetimes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Hillier, for a very comprehensive, informative talk on this very timely topic. We hope that you enjoyed this session and found it useful in your practice and helps bring you up to date on where the field is moving. We ask that you please complete your CME form so that you may receive credit for having listened to this session. We do hope that you will join us for future sessions. We have one additional session left in this year's version of Virtual Grand Rounds. So until next time, thank you for tuning in with us, and have a great day.